Right, so here we are, sailboats uh, with me. So, um, so first I'm gonna introduce a, a theory of mine. So I call it the whole hardness hierarchy of fluids. So my sort of theory is the more fluids you have to deal with, the harder, the harder something is. So at the bottom, you don't have to deal with any fluids. You don't even have to move. It's antenna tracker, no worries. Very straightforward. Um, so the next one up is rover. Still no fluids, Excellent. but you can you can move about. Uh, so at least it is still where you left it. If you go and do something, it's still there. So then, dealing with a single fluid, uh, you know, boat, sub, plane, copter, even helis. I mean, Matt's gonna spend an hour trying to convince you that helis are hard, but you know, it's only one fluid. It's not that difficult. Um, you know, quad planes. It's still one fluid. I mean, you're dealing with it in two ways, but it's still one fluid. You're just making it hard for yourself. So then two fluids, it's sailboats. <laughs> so you have to deal with the water and with the air, with the wind. So it's harder in, uh, <laughs> it's officially a tricky business. Um, so not only have you got to survive these two fluids, you've, you've actually got to take energy from them to, to move along. Um, Especially while drinking a third fluid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do petrol motors count as fluids? No. <laughs> and I mean, you could have some argument about like the number of dimensions you're moving in in the different fluids, but um, a sailboat, I mean, it's, it's tricky. And so actually, people don't really think of this, but um, like gliders, if you do like dynamic soaring, it's actually the same as a sailboat. So, uh, you know, a sailboat, half of your boat is in one fluid and half of the boat is in the other fluid for the whole time. Whereas uh, like a, a dynamic soaring glider, you have the whole of the vehicle in one fluid at a time, but you spend half of your time in one fluid and half of your time in the other fluid. Um, so it's essentially the same stuff. Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> so this is a, a sailing boat here. So we've got a, a mainsail and a jib sail, which is the stuff that deals with the one fluid and you have the keel and the rudder, which is the stuff that deals with the other fluid. And then the hull is just the bit in between that, that you know, keeps the, the bits in their respective fluids. Um, so I thought I'd give a little bit of, of background here on the sort of physics of, of sailing. It's a bit different from, uh, from other things that uh, we do. So uh, here you have a sail, which is just uh, an airfoil. Hopefully you can see my mouse here. So you've got uh, the lift and the drag. So then you get this resultant vector. So uh, if you rotate this to the direction, so you have quite a big force trying to make you go sideways uh, and actually not such a big force uh, driving you forwards. So, um, you know, why don't we just go sideways the whole time? So actually it's this other, the second fluid, we have a second uh, aerofoil or hydrofoil under the water, which is the keel. So then with your forward velocity, your boat slips just enough to get an angle of attack on your keel um, that cancels out exactly the, this side force of your sail from the wind. So people sort of think boats always go in a straight line, but they inherently have to go sideways a bit. Uh, so they go just sideways enough that you have this angle of attack here um, to, to, to cancel out the side force. So, so people sort of forget this and, you know, you'll see boats with half of their sail up because it's really windy. Well, equally you could keep your whole sail up and take half of your underwater area away, half of your keel away. Obviously it's a lot harder to do things like that. So um, people change their sails. So when, uh, so this is a keel boat. And again, you, you, you can't be straight upright. Like there, there's no writing moment if you're exactly level. So you have maximum force on the sail, but no writing moment at all. You have to tip over a little bit to get the writing moment. And at some tipping over angle, they will balance out nicely. And of course, the nice thing about uh, keelboats is even if you tip over all the way, it will, when the wind has passed or whatever, it will bob back up the right way uh, and keep you all nice and stable. So back to our, our little boat. So this is my, uh, my test boat. So it's a, a meter long here. And we've got a lunchbox from the pound shop with the flight controller in and the GPS. And this actually, I'm cheating a little bit, so I've got a motor on my uh, on my sailing boat. 
and we've got uh, radio control antennas. I don't know how many of you have done water rovers, but it really surprised me the amount of difference it made just getting the antennas up the mast. Uh, it really made a, a drastic difference to the, to the range. And then on the top, we have the key piece of, uh, of sailboat hardware, which is the wind vane. We need to know where the wind is coming from so we can, can trim the sails. So how do we do that? So we support a couple of different sensors. So uh, we support NAMIA uh, 0183 wind vanes, which is a, it's a standard yachting uh, protocol. So just by supporting these, you, you automatically support hundreds of different uh, makes. Uh, and, and they're meant for full, full size yachts uh, for the most part. So they're rugged and, and, and accurate and, and they are a little more expensive. Um, I mean, the main issue with, with these is they're meant for full size yachts. So unless you've got really quite a big boat, they're just too big and heavy. So this one from uh, Calypso Instruments, a little ultrasonic unit that gives uh, speed and direction at once. Um, so actually it is, yeah. I don't know if you can see that in my, uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's very small. <laughs> but we sort of trade off so it's not waterproof anymore because it's so, it's so tiny. How much um, does that cost? So they're, I think, 300 uh, euros, I think it would be. So they're, you know, they're, they're a little expensive and they're more expensive than a, a sort of uh, a bigger one, but it's, it's, worth, it's worth paying. So you sort of, the, those ones are expensive because they're small. The sort of bigger yacht size ones are expensive because they're, you know, you want to only go up your mast once every 10 years or something to put one up. Um, yeah. So when we support, uh, like, uh, sensing the wind from RPM sensor, like your, your typical spinning cups, you know, half a ping pong ball on a stick job. Uh, so there's loads of those available. Uh, and you just, we just support that via the RPM uh, library. And the trouble with these is often you'll you'll buy one, but it'll be meant for use with some uh, you know manufacturer's unit. And although you can read the sensor, you need the magic you know calibration number that says uh, I'm spinning this fast. This is what the wind is. Do this multiplication. And we also support just an analog. So this is a 360 degree rotation potentiometer with a big wind vane on it. Um, so that's really where we started, and that's a very cheap way to get started. It's not as uh, it's not as accurate. Uh, but it gets you started and it's, um, you know, it's nice, but because it's, you know, there's some friction on your potentiometer here and stuff, you need quite a big uh, vein to, to point it into the wind accurately. Um, so really these, these ultrasonic ones are very nice. Um, yeah, so the, so the basis of sailing. So I thought we would cover this a little bit. So we can't go straight into the wind. Uh, you know, that sort of, that would be too easy. So you have to, you have to be at some angle to the wind so you, your sails will fill. Um, I mean, it's back to that, that first diagram. If you point too far into the wind, you just haven't got any forward thrust. Your vectors are so, so terrible, you can't go forwards at all. Um, so then we have tacks. So a port, which is left and starboard, which is right. Uh, I mean, you should all know that from uh, planes and stuff. Uh, conveniently use the same lingo. So starboard tack is on the left-hand side looking looking down, and that's because the wind is coming over the right-hand side, the starboard side of the boat first. So we've got starboard and port tacks here. Um, so if we do a tack, it's a little confusing this, the, the lingo is always a bit weird. So the a tack is to go from one tack to the other tack, passing through this no-go zone. So if you pass through the wind, uh, as you change from one tack to other, you've done attack. And, and that's the important one for the code, really. Um, so the other way is a jibe. And actually, we don't care very much about, about jibing. Like, there's no point you could get stuck. Like, if you do half attack and stop, you know, you're going to stop moving. But a jibe, whatever, you know, you can point at any angle down here. So we don't deal with jibes any differently than, you know, just sailing downwind normally. Um, so, so the code is, is very straightforward, essentially. We, we define the, the sort of the slice of the pie that we can't, we can't sail in with a, an angle here. And if you're trying to go in that direction, we just say, oh, you can't do that. You have to sail either 
the tightest one on the left or the tightest one on the right. Um, and depending on boats, you know, some sort of slow thing plugged along might have quite a big angle here and sort of a more sporty thing might be able to go a bit tighter to the wind. So we have this, uh, this lovely parameter, so you can, you can play about with that. So we, we jump into the code. This is from the, uh, the block diagram from the, from the Argerover uh, wiki. So we jump in the code right at a, a, a low level. So, so just as we're doing the steering, we say, oh, you're trying to go in this direction. Oh, you can't do that. Um, so we, we stop using the L1 controller and we just do a heading controller. Um, and because we jump in at this low level, it means you know, modes and everything just work. You know, we didn't have to deal with RTL especially. RTL just worked. Um, but I mean, it does mean that we're sort of, we, we're not using the L1 when uh, perhaps we could take advantage of, of some of the more navig like the, the clever navigation than just saying, you know, sail at this angle. Uh, and for example, for tacking, we don't really deal with it clever. You, you know, you're, you're sailing along at one angle and then suddenly it says, oh, now you need to be at this other angle. Um, so maybe there's some some work we can do there in the future. And actually there's a couple of gotchas. Like we can, if we aren't trying to sail at wind, say we're just trying to sail across the wind with the wind coming from the top, uh, using the L1 controller, if there's a lot of tide or, or you drift down from your desired line, the, the destination you're trying to get to isn't upwind, but it will try and sail straight back upwind to get onto the line. So there's some sort of funny edge cases you can accidentally fall into. Uh, as you as you swap between these two methods, um, but for the most part, it seems to handle everything just fine. Like you can pick whatever mode you like, and it basically just works. So this is my first successful sailing. You probably remember this from, I think it was, it was two years ago or year and year and a half ago, uh, the end of the summer, year before last. This was. So now it's coming back up in. You can see me press the press the switch which causes it to tack hopefully this is coming through okay so i press the switch again there and then this last one so now it doesn't need me to tell it it says oh i can get there now i'll just turn in and get straight to the waypoint and then you <laughs> we'll see my poor poor tuning here as it does an rtl and is wobbling backwards and forwards <laughs> So this is our SITL simulator. So we have a pretend sailboat that we can, uh, we can sail. So here the wind's coming from the bottom. So we're trying to get from waypoint A to B here. And because we've got a fence, we're inside this geofence, it's bouncing off the geofence on one side. So we can still abide by geofences and things. And then on the other side, there's a parameter, so it says, I'm gonna try and keep my cross-check error to less than 100 in this case. So hopefully when I've clicked the button in the video, here we are, so this is the cross-check error here. So you'll see it gets to 100 just, and then it bounces back, it does its tech. So this sort of lets you control, you know, I want to go over there, but I want to roughly stay, you know, on the line between the two waypoints. So you can set this to a very large number. And if we, you can just turn this off and then it would just do one very long straight thing, one tack and go to the waypoint there. Um, but, you know, you can set it uh, however you like. The, the, if you set it too tiny, it'll spend its whole time trying to trying to change direction. And you need a bit of a straight run to, to build up some speed so you can, so you can change direction here. So because we can bounce off a geofence, this means we can do dexterous path planning. So again, this is one of the nice features. It just works. Uh, we didn't have to modify it at all. It just worked. So here the wind's coming from the top and you can see we've come off the path here because we're having to tack into the wind. I should say, if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to jump in as we go along. So here we are coming back. So now the wind's behind. We don't do any fancy sailing stuff. It just follows the, the path exactly. So I mean, this is a, 
you know, there's sort of a, an assumption built built right into Dijkstra's, which is the shortest route is the best. Uh, and maybe that isn't always the case, uh, especially for sailing. There might be uh, some different route that, that would be more efficient rather than straight shortest distance. And maybe you want to conserve battery. Maybe you want to get there with the, the least battery usage. So these are, are things we, we might think about adding in the future. So motoring. So uh, I know uh, OCS yesterday were talking about how they have a, an engine and sometimes they use it and sometimes not. So we can, we can do that. So we've got sort of three states of, of using an engine. So there's force motoring, which is I've forgotten I've got a sail on my boat. I'm just a rover. Uh, let's not even consider the sail. There's force sailing, which is I've forgotten I've got an engine. Let's just use the sail. Um, so they're quite handy. Like, so for example, um, you know, if you just, if you're up at a dock or something, you can just use the engine. Let's just get, let's just do this tricky bit quickly with the engine. And then once you've got a bit more room, you can, you can start sailing. And then the third is allow motor. So the code will actually decide itself. So there's a wind speed threshold you can set in a, in a parameter. So it can say, oh, there's, there's not enough wind. I'll stop trying to sail and just use the engine. And then as well, if it's tacking. So if the wind is light, often you can go in a straight line but you, you sort of don't have enough momentum to shoot round the tack and, and pick up on the new tack. So you'll get halfway and get stuck. So it detects it's got stuck and it'll shoot on the motor, whiz round and, and carry on. So it, it's, uh, and the other thing we can do, so if you've just got a normal rover and you're doing super long mapping missions, you can put a sail on and you can set it up so it will trim the sail, but it won't do any sailing stuff. It will just trim the sail and sail like a normal rover. And you might find this is quite a big uh, efficiency improvement if the wind is in a nice direction for your, for your mission. You, you can sort of you know, use the free energy, save the planet. Uh, so wing sails is another feature that is uh, now in master. So this is a, a sail with sort of an elevator. If you think of a plane that's sort of crashed with one wing right down, stuck in the boat. Uh, so this, this would be the elevator. So the elevator steers the wing into the wind. So instead of pulling the sail in with a bit of string, you use the wind to, to actuate the sail itself. So there's a couple of nice things. The first thing is it, it's actuated based on the wind, not based on where your boat is. So you just set it to an angle. You say, be at this angle for the wind, and it trims itself. Like you don't have to say, oh, the wind's changed 10 degrees. It's set relative to the wind, so it just moves around. Um, so that's a nice feature of, of these. Uh, sails. So if you've got some super long mission, you don't have to sit, sit, you know, trimming your, your sail and wearing out your actuator. You can just say, be at this angle to the wind and, and leave it and it will sort itself out. Uh, and the other advantage is it's a hard sail. So there's sort of a, with a, a soft sail, there's a minimum amount of, of power that you can sort of get out of the sail. If you let the sail out too far, so it's got a low angle of attack. It'll just start flapping like a flag. So that's sort of a minimum, minimum amount of, 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 of force you can, you can get from the sail before it starts flapping. And when it starts flapping, the drag goes up loads. So often on yachts, you'll have you know, half a dozen, dozen different sail sizes and you'll constantly be, be putting them up and taking them down. And that's because there's this minimum power. If you let the sail out too much, it'll start flapping. And, and the big increase in drag is 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 nasty, uh, if effectively. So this lets you have a big sail that copes better if it's really windy, so you can feather it more efficiently. So AIS, and uh, again, we were talking about this a little bit yesterday. So this is a, a map from the AIS boats on uh, marinetraffic.com is like freight, uh, flight radar for ADSB. So there's a few boats uh, around Swansea here. Uh, this was a couple of days ago. So basically we want to, to replicate ADSB. So here I have, again, Namir comes back, uh, uh, yachting standard. So you can get a, a receiver here. Uh, it needs a logic converter because it's uh, RS-232 levels. And we can just put that straight into serial in and it will decode these messages and hopefully show you where all the boats are. So one disadvantage of, of 
ADSB relative or, or of AIS relative to ADSB is the frequency is is lower. So hopefully you can <laughs> you can see my antenna here. You have to have a much bigger antenna, which is a you know it's not as nice. Uh, you know you can't just have it built in uh, to a flight controller because it is big. But but because it is a lower frequency, you need a bigger antenna. But also your range is better, uh, and we don't get you know you don't get outrageous ranges like you get with ADSB because you know it's not direct line of sight. It ha it has to be on the surface of the planet somewhere. <laughs> So you so you might get ten kilometers or something um, of range, but uh, ADSB there's a few sort of tricks. So it'll you can send messages and ask another boat to relay your message for you and things like that. So you get you get plenty of range for the speed <laughs> boats are moving at. Um, so there's a new message uh, which is in Mavlink Master, and there's this uh, this PR. So this PR here I sort of uh, since we weren't flying out to Australia, I had some free time, so I thought I'll do a, I'll do a feature. Um, so we now can log AIS, and it sends the Mavlink message. So it would be nice. I don't know if uh, Mr. Oborn is here, but it would be great to to plot the pretty pictures in in GCSs and things. Yeah, so okay. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, so here I've. I've got stuff from from like six kilometers, and I'm you know I'm indoors. The sea is is uh, probably a kilometer away, but I can't you know I can't see it out the window. So we're getting uh, we're getting quite good good range here. Um, so yeah, coming soon. So at the moment, it just uh, saves everything to data flash. And actually, there's a bunch of of messages. So I, I've only added support for two messages, but there's things like there's a search and rescue. Uh, aircraft message, which I haven't added yet, but but for for copters and planes, I mean, if you're operating near the sea, it would be nice not to just fly over the top of boats, probably. But uh, AS has this a better range than ADSB, so you could potentially pick up these low flying search and rescue type vehicles, which are the ones that are going to catch you out, and you need to be concerned about. You could potentially catch them with AIS further away than you might catch them with ADSB. And actually, the AIS, there's loads of, of really complicated messages. So for example, there's, uh, there's like a geofence message. So if the military are doing some training or something, they'll put out uh, like a NOTAM equivalent of don't sail through this bit of water. And often if you try and sail through a bit of water, some angry people with guns and a boat will come until you to clear off. Um, so, they will have an ADSB, so their vessels will broadcast this. There's a geofence here, and these are the points. It's a rectangle, or it's it's this other shape. These are the points. Don't don't sail inside this area. So we could potentially do some sort of real time uh, geofences and things like this. And you can send like arbitrary binary data over AIS. If you know one captain needs to send some information to another one, you can get information on tides and things like this. Um, so potentially there's there's lots of stuff we can do, and only I've, I've only added the basic thing. But what the, this PR does do is it logs if it's received a message that it doesn't understand, it it logs it. So I'm hoping that if a few people start to use things like this, we will sort of get a record of what sort of messages are actually used. I mean, there's no point in adding support for these fancy fence messages if actually in the wild no, nobody bothers to send them. Um, so yeah hopefully exciting features to come. So as I say, at the moment, we only log uh, and display on the GCS. But once uh, that seems to be working fine and we're getting the right, the right stuff, uh, you know, adding this to avoidance is, is fairly trivial. Uh, we just have to add it to the, to the database. And then we can avoid chips and things. Uh, so that'll be hopefully a nice feature. The main trouble with developing this AIS stuff is boats, it's not like ADSB where, where they sort of send almost constantly. They'll send sort of what type of boat they are and what the name is and where it's going about once every 10 minutes and then they'll send a position. This is my ID, this is where I am. They'll send that 
you know, once a minute or something. It, so it's not, um, you know, I can sit here for an hour and maybe I'll get, you know, 20 messages to, to see if I've decoded them properly. Um, of course, if you're by a big port somewhere, obviously you'll get loads of stuff, but um, yeah. So it's quite fun. Uh, and hopefully a few more people can have a play about with this in the future. So where can we go from here? So I'm sort of there's, there was the two options. One is the OCS route of make some, some really high quality, high endurance thing, or there's the make a really fast thing and see how it goes. So hopefully you can see this video. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Great, so this is a, it's a hydrofoiling boat and it's, it's got to the record, the speed record from this video is 34 kilometers an hour. So in boat terms, that's about 18 knots. So I don't know how many people, how many of you have been on sort of small size boats, but if you're going 18 knots, I mean, you're gonna notice that you're probably gonna get very wet. It's gonna be uncomfortable. So this is, uh, you know, this is pushing it. I mean, even for a normal rover, let alone a sailing rover, uh, something like this w would be a real a challenge to, to sail. So, um, whoops. So here we are. So I, I managed to get my hands on, on one of these vehicles to play with. Um, so obviously there's, a, there's quite a few differences. So this is a, a Mini 40 class trimaran. So the, you can see the old, the original boat here in the background suddenly looks not, not so big. Um, so the, the main sort of difference here, we've, we've gone from a keel boat with a keel and there's about two and a half kilograms of lead at the keel here to, to, to keep you upright. So we've gone from that, that you can, it'll go upside down and, and bob back up the right way to a, a trimaran where, oh no, if we fall over, we've really fallen over, you know, that's it. Someone will have to go and, and turn it the right way again. So that's gonna be a, a challenge. And it uses the, hydrofoil, so it comes out of the water completely. So I thought I'd just give a little bit of a, a background on how, on how this works. So it uses this sort of two, a V shape, one foil on each side, and then the a one a T shape foil at the back. So it's, it was pioneered by this uh, French trimaran, Le, Le hydro, Hydropter, I believe, I, sorry. Uh, it's the hydrofoil in French. Um, so this actually holds, or held for a bit, I think they've been beaten there, but it held several records and actually it's quite unusual. It held like a top speed record and it held, uh, you know, endurance records. So it, I think it had the, the record across the channel and it's quite unusual for a boat or a vehicle of any sort that the, the thing that can do the absolute top speed can also do, you know, endurance and, and long duration stuff. So this is quite a, a pioneering boat really uh, that we've sort of, borrowed the uh, the sort of passive stability system from. So it is passively stable. So the key thing is that, or well, the most important thing is you have a really long rudder. So the rudder comes down, there's a foil at the back that is just like an elevator on your plane. And it's long. So you want the last thing that comes out of the water. If it's going to come out of the water, you want that to be the last thing. Like as soon as the rudder has come out of the water, you might as well not have a rudder. Like it doesn't work that well in the air. Um, so that's a key thing. And then as it comes out of the water, because of this angled uh, system on the foils, as it comes up, there's less of them left in the water. So that sort of self-regulates the ride height. So you will find a speed, you'll, you'll end up at some point along the foils here. And if you go faster, you'll come out a bit more. Um, and it, it sort of regulates, uh, depending on how heavy you are, obviously, and, and how fast you're going. But obviously being at this angle and to get that nice self-regulating force, we were actually generating the load here at, at 45 degrees. So are we, we are wasting this sort of a side force. There's one on each side, it's just canceling out. So, I mean, maybe there's a, maybe there's a better way. So uh, you can use, you could, you could change this. So you go down a bit and then you come straight across and then your, your lift is sort of more useful, but um, what actually happens is you, you have a, a sort of a smaller sort of safe zone 
So as soon as you get your foil close to the surface of the water here, it'll uh, start to break out the top of the water. So your sort of safe bit of, of sort of a safe height. So your hull isn't in the water, so you're going fast, but you're not too far out of the water that you're going to fall over. Um, so uh, this sort of 45 degrees is a nice sort of passive limit and everything. You have sort of a safer height. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, it's the same with the, if the foils come out of the water, you know, you might as well not have them. And often what happens in these sort of boats is you go too fast, you sort of jump out of the water, and then it all comes crashing back down. So some America's Cup boats have, have tried this uh, sort of more aggressive angle, and they sort of use clever um, sort of fly-by-wire systems that they try and sort of trade off passive stability for, for you know, uh, like uh, control system stability, uh, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, it's quite difficult. Uh, they tend to fall over. Oops. <laughs> yeah, oops. <laughs> so and the other thing of this sort of passive stability. So obviously, if you're you're tipping over uh, one way, like your one foil will come out of the water and stop producing lift at all. And, and equally, the other one will have to dig in more because your weight is, is the same. But that sort of has a self-writing effect. And also, as you tip over, uh, your side force drops off because you know, your, your force vector is coming uh, like vertical. So you've got no side force anymore. So you've still got the big side force of the sail. So they'll actually start to skid sideways really quite fast um, if they tip over too much. So it, again, it sort of it sort of passively stabilizes it. If you tip over too much, you start shooting sideways, which takes the wind out of the sail. Um, so this sort of sort of clever design of, of, of the, I mean, it's just like a plane. You can, you can design it to, to be stable. And I, I, I don't know if there's sort of a static margin of boats, but it's, it's sort of the same idea. You can, you can trade off how stable you want to be for how hard it is to sort of stay in the, in the in the butter region, um, so here's my uh, my boat here when I've I've fitted the the flight controller and stuff, and it is it's quite big, uh, and it, it sort of it falls into the sort of glider category of being enormous, but everything is really really fiddly um, to get everything on. So here we can see uh, it's got an engine on uh, to start with. So this is just because it's a lot to do to, to tune up something that's going to be going uh, hopefully as fast as this will, will, help, will hopefully go. It's going to be a lot of work to tune it with the sail straight off the, straight off the bat. So hopefully we can use the engine and get it you know, going in a straight line, tune up the, the heading controller first, and then sort of add the sailing onto that is the plan. Um, so we have lots of extra things that boats don't usually have. So we've got a normal rudder, but now our rudder can go backwards and forwards. So you can adjust the angle of attack on your rudder. And the two foils on the side, again, we can adjust the angle of attack and we can even do them uh, differentially. So, so this is sort of, to start with anyway, it's gonna be more of a, a trim. So you probably wouldn't be doing this, you know, really fast as you're going along, but you might play with this and find a nice sort of trim position for the, uh, for the boat uh, to start with anyway. Uh, so actually this, there's a PR here uh, that adds, uh, first of all, it, it lets Rover control, you know, I've got an elevator and flapper ons, which is, is what I've borrowed the plane mixer for, but it does add roll and pitch PID control to Rover. And as I say, to start with it, it'll probably be sort of a, a, a trim thing. So we probably use, you know, mostly a bit of uh, integrator and just trim everything out. But in the future, uh, maybe we can, we can look at sort of more aggressive foil shapes and, and trade off this sort of speed for stability and use the flight controller itself to, to stabilize. Um, so here's the, the first test uh, with the sail. And this so far is the only time I've managed to, to get out with it. So it, I only finished it. Uh, probably the end of January and the weather's been nasty and now we're all not allowed to leave the house. So, um, so this is loitering. 
And one thing you'll notice is it's got a big polystyrene ball at the top of the mast. <laughs> so uh, if it does capsize, it, it sort of floats half, half fallen over, um, which is nice. It, if they go all the way upside down, suddenly you can't see them anymore. Suddenly there's nothing sticking out of the water hardly. Um, That's really nice. So yeah, it uh, again, it just it just loiters. I mean, the trouble you can see it really slows down turning because it is so wide compared to a normal, a normal boat. It um, you know it struggles to turn a little bit when there's when there's light winds. Um, How much? So I have it had it to get up on the foils. So it needs uh, you know, ten ten miles an hour, something like this, probably. And it actually, it comes with, or it, had, it came with sort of three sets of sails. So this is the biggest set of sails on at the moment. And there's sort of two smaller sizes. I mean, and if I was stood next to this, I mean, that's uh, pretty six foot tall. Um, so, and I have had it up and foiling with the engine on, but it was all very exciting. And I was too busy trying not to crash. <laughs> so I'm afraid there's no video of that. Um, so I was hoping to sort of go in. The weather is improving, and the plan was to sort of get out and get this working really nicely. Uh, but uh, that's on hold at the moment. So sort of sort of future problems. So when I'm allowed to go out and play about again, this this is some some future problems I I suspect we'll we will bump into. So at the moment with our keelboats, we can not go that fast. You you might go a tenth of the wind speed. So if the wind is is ten miles an hour, you might go one mile an hour. So the the foiling allows us to, we, we should be able to match the wind speed. So you, in 10 miles an hour of wind, the boat ought to be able to go about 10 miles an hour. So suddenly apparent wind becomes a big factor. So the moment we're sailing to an, uh, at a constant angle to the true wind direction. So, uh, you know, just, if you stick your head out of the car on the motorway, the wind is gonna be coming from right in front of you. So it's the same thing. Um, so as we accelerate and we go faster, the wind direction changes. So we will have to, deal with that and especially as you accelerate you have to uh, sort of deal with it you can't um sort of just set an angle necessarily you sort of you have to sort of pass through the going slowly to get to the going fast you can't just jump straight to the at this direction we will go fast angle um so that is something we will uh, have to deal with i think definitely um and also rather than uh, adjusting the, the sail we can change heading so uh, if you've been out sailing you wouldn't you know sail at a constant angle and just sit and play with the sail you would play with both at once so if a gust comes you would let the sail out a bit and you might turn a little bit uh, at the same time so we need to sort of bring in this sort of combined uh i don't know an, an analogy might be sort of combined uh turns in a, in a plane where you use the rudder as well so you, you sort of you want to use both of the things that you have to control the boat. So you want, might want to let the sail out and change direction a little bit. Uh, and there's sort of, it's sort of the nicer way of doing it. Um, so it's something we have to look at. And, and as well as that, obviously if you're change direction and let the sail out, you can do those things at the same time. So you get a, a better response time. Um, so hopefully that'll give a, a, a smoother ride. And waves. So I predict this boat will not like waves very much. Obviously, there's some sort of the wave height of, I don't know, uh, six, eight inches or something, 15 centimeters, and it'll be so that the hull is at the top of the waves and the foils are coming out underneath. So I think sort of this sort of short, steep, choppy waves, uh, we might have to sort of have some, some clever thing that just says, oh, don't try and go too fast, sort of take it easy. Uh, and again, going too fast is another problem we might have at the moment with keelboats. We just say, go as fast as you can. And with a keelboat that can't go that fast, that's no big deal. But with something like this, you probably don't want to be going flat out the whole time. Uh, you know, you might get into some exciting situations. So, we, yeah, adding a sort of speed control or at least a, a speed limit. Maybe you might not want to say, go this fast. Well, you might want to say, don't go faster than this, something, something like that. So coming up, uh, hopefully late August, early September, in the UK somewhere, is the World Robotic Sailing Championship 2020. Uh, 
So annoyingly, when I actually, when I first started doing the sailboat stuff two years ago, this was actually going on in, uh, down in Southampton. <laughs> sort of when I, when I was doing my first sail, this had just started. Uh, but I hadn't, uh, I missed it basically. I hadn't clocked that it was going on and I didn't really think I would be a, a position to go, to go along. So this year it's in the UK again, hopefully. And actually lots of the teams already use uh, Arduino pilot boards or flight controllers, but they just uh, use them to provide a, a nice location. Basically they, they piggyback on the nice EKF and get the, the angles and, and speeds and things but they do all the actual sailing using uh, Raspberry Pi or something. Uh, so hopefully we can convert some of the, some of the people to, to just do it all on board. I mean, because a lot of them, as I say, a lot of them have the hardware there anyway. Um, so there's uh, sort of four challenges uh, that are part of this, uh, this competition. So the first one is a, a fleet race, uh, they call it, which is basically a, a time trial. So you, have to, you start somewhere, you go around some boys, and you finish somewhere. So we can do this already. Hopefully, it'll it'll you know set the waypoint and go. Hopefully. Um, so the next challenge is a is a loiter. Basically, uh, they call it station keeping. Um, so the first one we can do. So that's loiter around a pretend location, and you get points. I think you have a sort of a five minute window, and they take your average distance uh, for five minutes from this point. So this is, again, it's something we can already do. We already have, uh, have loiter. Um, maybe for my, um, this is a case where a keelboat might be better than my new fast boat. You know, if you're going slowly, you, you, it doesn't take, you know, you've got a longer before you get far away. Um, but the second uh, sort of part of this is it's a loiter again, but instead of a pretend boy, it's a real boy. So they tell you where the boy is, but you have to, stay as close to it as you can without hitting it so it'll be sort of a red uh, color or some bright color and you have to use you know object avoidance some a camera to sort of stay close but don't bump into it and again you it's the average position over five minutes or something but you get points taken away for every time you bump into it uh, so the third sort of challenge is a mapping type mission you are given an area with that's like subdivided into a, little, a grid and you get you know x points for each grid box you you visit and actually i think a few years they've they've had bonus points if you can like take some reading so if you can use uh, sonar to say how deep it is you get sort of bonus points and again this is something where the foiling boat you know there's nothing in the water to take a reading with your sonar wouldn't be in the water anymore uh, so again hopefully this is one of the things we can just do. It, it, we just program a mapping mission and hopefully it will just work. So in the fourth uh, mission is sort of a, a QR code hide and seek. That, uh, so you, you have, it's like a head to head type thing and it's a bit like cricket. Uh, so you have sort of your stumps at either end and you get points each time you manage to go between them. Uh, and then you're, they're your safe zones. So you'll have two boats trying to do this at once. And then you get a point if you can see the QR code on the sail of the other boat, and they get points if they can see yours. Um, so with the sailing we can do, but uh, you know, if anyone fancies doing some computer vision, uh, you know, we can uh, hopefully do okay at this. Uh, that's the plan. I mean, all being well, if it hopefully goes ahead. Uh, yeah, hopefully we can put, put in an entry. And as I say, I've not done computer vision stuff before. So if anyone is keen, that would be great. Uh, yeah. So any questions? And this is my boat here. As I say, it's quite big <laughs> in person. That is absolutely fantastic. That's a, that's a great toy. You've made several people in the audience uh, jealous and now wanting to go out and buy boats, <laughs> uh, as you'll see from the chat when you have a look later. I've not. Um, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, do we have any questions from the floor? Yeah, hi Peter, it's Lloyd here from OCS. Um, hi. Great presentation, love Thank the you. stuff you're doing. Um, I wish you'd been around a couple of years ago when we first started our journey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so um, I, 
you know, you probably got from Matt's talk yesterday that we started uh, a few years ago now on an older version of the Rover Code, which didn't include any of your fantastic sailing stuff. And uh, we've recently done a rebase and uh, still waiting to test out your sailing code. So um, we're looking forward to it a lot. Okay. Um, a couple of things you mentioned, like uh, tacking and going into irons, you know, that's, that's something we dealt with by, you know, applying motor. As we go around, if you're in a pure sailing boat, it's very difficult to handle that unless you have a motor. Um, unless you can keep plenty of boat speed up, you know, tacks are quite difficult sometimes. Um, we we found this out early and we introduced a jibe only mode type of thing. So rather than tacking the boat with jibe, um, it's a safer way of getting to the other tack if you don't have a motor available. Um, yeah, no, lots of interesting stuff, great. Um, great to hear you talk and looking forward to trying out our rebase algae pilot with your sailing code. Great. Yeah, I mean, tacking like that is something I've not, basically I'm on this little river, basically there, there isn't very much room. So if you try and do jive only tacking, suddenly you find, oh, yeah, uh, you're, you're you find you're not going anywhere. And I <laughs> think <laughs> stuff like that is quite hard to sort of boil down to a set of generic parameters that will work for any vehicle i think um yeah i don't know maybe we just need to spend some more time thinking about it yeah yeah um i agree uh, but yeah unless you you know luckily our boats always have a motor on them so they always are a, are able to power through a tack type of thing that um if you were in a traditional sailing method without a motor you you'd often find it, find it quite difficult to tack especially with your new foiling boat i think <laughs> yes yeah and it would be very susceptible to getting bits of weed and, and picking up rubbish, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, I love the look of it. Um, I can't wait to see it going with Arjun Pilot driving it. Great. At speed. Yeah, that's the plan. That's the plan. So if you, with the normal skiff sort of sailing, if you get stuck in irons while trying to tack, then you normally just back the sail and reverse the rudder and then, you yeah, know, you get reverse yourself the out rudder and it's a bit messy. It. Yeah, you reverse the rudder and wait till you get at an angle where you can then pull the sail on again and get going again. Obviously. Yeah, we do that in Arch Pilot now. Catamarans have a big problem with it. So, I mean, you could it, it sort of works by mistake because it notices you'll start going backwards, so it reverses the rudder for you to, oh, to carry okay. on turning. Oh, we yep. didn't have that in our codes. Uh, that's your code. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. So it's work just in because too. I used to do it in a Hobie 14. It's, it worked in that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's definitely... I don't know what tricky. the foils will do with it. I mean, the, the, <laughs> that... <laughs> if you go backwards, it'll suck down, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you'll have to sort of reverse the pitch angle on the back, too, because you, you could actually, you know, pull the stern underneath if you're going back too fast for the big wind. Definitely. It could get really nasty. Yes, lots of exciting things. And I say there's sort of extra jeopardy with this is because if it does fall over, you know, someone's going to have to go and turn it the right way up. Would it actually sail backwards? Could you actually foil it backwards? Make it bi-directional? I don't think so. Why not? <laughs> um, so the foil shape's probably wrong on the foil. Yeah, I mean, you, a plane can't fly backwards, basically. It's um, a, yeah, same principle as a plane, Tridge. So uh, you yeah. do it in your, in your plane and then they'll do it on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> so, so, you know, theoretically, if you had a really tight control system, sure, you could do that. But um... Uh, um, so, Peter, the the AIS stuff you're talking about, um, we've captured a lot of AIS data. Um, we're using an enemy A two K AIS, yep. but we're we're connecting to it with a different process than Arch Pilot and we're just um, generating Arch Pilot messages from the other process. Um, so we've got a fair bit of AAS data, but I personally I haven't seen these um, geofence type AAS messages that you've been talking about. I, I know the static messages come every 10 minutes and the position updates depend on the speed of the vessel and the class of the AIS. So if the, the vessel's moving faster, then you'll get AIS position updates more frequently. But if the vessel's just drifting, then you may get AIS updates every 10 minutes or something like that. So there's a big, big difference between that and ADSB. And I'll just, um, you know, let everybody know that. 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, like I say, I haven't, you know, I've maybe received, you know, a hundred messages or something in, in the in the time of my messing with it. Um, yeah. And, so and that's, a, that's an NMEI 183 AIS you're using? That's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we're, so we're using NMEI 2K on our boat, and that's, um, you know, you get better better bandwidth over the NMEI 2K bus, so you get lots more messages, but, um, you know, Enemy A2K is a problem. We've been using the, I think it was the Cambo stuff to decode the enemy A2K messages. Yeah, because oh. I think it's just it's just can a CAN bus protocol. So I think we could theoretically support it, but I think there's some I think like to get an official copy of the protocol is document is expensive or something. I looked yeah, into yeah. it briefly. Yeah, it's proprietary, it's all expensive. Yeah. But, um, and the other the other thing about the air sensors you're using, we're using um, an air mass sensor on our boat, um, and that comes with you know that has a GPS in it, ultrasonic wind speed and direction, and it has a compass in it. So we've you know we've struggled to integrate that compass with the normal large pilot compass type of thing because you know in our in the first bit of code that we wrote we introduced the idea of a simple compass that just told us the heading of the boat type of thing and um, that was a big struggle for us in the early days. <laughs> yeah, because I did, uh, I looked very briefly, but I think that the trouble with compasses over Namir is that basically the update rate is quite slow. So it potentially is too slow to feed directly into the EKF, potentially yeah. getting well outside my um, <laughs> my area what's, there. What's the update rate? Yeah. Oh, it might be one hertz or something, or even, even slower than that. Uh, one hertz um, wouldn't be a problem for the EKF in terms of compass. It then needs a slow update. We can work with that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Most of, most of the trouble we had was that um, all the compass code in the EKF looked at the the mag offsets and all those sort of things, and we don't get that out of the simple compass. You know, we just get a heading. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it might it might be a sort of path similar to the the GPS heading stuff. There might be something we could sort of feed it in a bit like that stuff potentially. Anyway, we're just about to try with the, the rebased code up to including your sailing code so and the new AKF stuff. So we're really looking forward to that. Great. Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing how you get on. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation, Peter. Anybody else has any questions? All right. Is it, is it uh, this, this contest that you're talking about, it was, is there an entry fee? Oh, yeah, yeah maybe a couple hundred quid. I mean, it's not, um, okay. it's not, uh, you know, it'll be, you know, you go and, and, you know, they make you dinner for you and, and you know, it's not, um, you know, yeah, it's well, not. I'm just wondering if, if this is something that maybe Archer Pilot would sponsor or something like that. Like, I, mean, I, I, I don't think it's, it's going to be too, um, too terrible. I mean, I'm just hoping it, it goes ahead uh, at the moment, to be honest. Mm, sure, sure. <laughs> I think we could throw some money your way. Super, super, thank you. I did have um, a, a query on the loitering. Uh, it seemed to be yeah. a rather active loitering, um, you know, sailing pretty aggressively yeah. both ways across the point. Have you considered um, uh, you know, stalling the boat essentially and just letting it drift? You know, trying to keep it as actively stalled as you can. So you you can do that, but the trouble with that is getting unstalled when you decided that you don't want to be stalled anymore is is the tricky bit. So sort of in in sailing terms or in algebra over sailing, a loiter is sailing inside your loiter radius. So it it uses the loiter radius, it sort of bounces off the radius, and and just hangs out inside that circle. So you can set a really small radius. Um, but it'll, as you go more slowly, you can't steer, basically. There's like a minimum speed to keep up steerage. And if you get stuck in a, a funny angle, it'll, uh, you know, it's really hard to get going again. And the other thing is if you try and stay still, potentially you'll, you'll just sort of blow down wind. So what, some of the first exciting experiments I had is hold mode is if you're going downwind and you switch into hold mode, it lets the sail out all the way and keeps the rudder in the middle which means it carries on at exactly the same speed, <laughs> except you can't control it anymore. <laughs> so for holding position, I mean, in a 
normal sailing competition, you know, wiggling the rudder backwards and forwards rapidly to give you some thrust in low wind is considered to be, you know, bad form. But is that the same in, you know, these little things? Could you could you actually have the servo wiggle the, the rudder backwards and forwards enough to give you enough thrust to get I out mean, of irons? Potentially. I mean, I think it doesn't. It's not, it's not super effective. It, it, might, it might work. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I... I mean, that's what people do in the sailing they competitions, do, yeah. actually. But it's sort of, check there's no one, no one watching it. <laughs> so, uh, like, at the moment, like, we've sort of... We, it's something we need to add, basically, is getting out of irons and, and getting stuck in tacks and things. We need to add sort of ways to cope with if that does happen. At the moment, we're just saying, oh, we're, we're not going to let you sail in a situation where that might happen. So we need to say, okay, you can, or it might happen anyway, even though you didn't mean it to, we need to sort of add some special logic for dealing with that. I think with the trouble with boats is the sort of, you know, it's hard to say, you know, this behavior will work with all boats in all situations. It's, it's quite tricky. And, and especially we only have, you know, half a dozen people sailing Arjun River boats, as far as I know, something like that. We just need more people. Everyone, go and build a, a, a model boat. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, a I, solid winged boat um, would uh, would help that because of the uh, like the tail on the wing would maintain um, lift. It would be a sideways lift, one way or another. But um, when you're sort of directly into the wind, um, you you would be able to set that sail to just either direction and it would pull the boat sideways is that right yeah yeah i think so yeah yeah and of course the trouble with a, a sort of soft sail boat is you you're always pulling it to the middle of the boat so you can't you know you can't push a piece of string basically so you can't hold the sail out uh like if you got stuck in an irons in an actual boat you would probably use your hand to push the boom so you would go back faster and then you can steer again going backwards and obviously we can't do that with a piece of string but as you say a solid sail you can do that again. Can you set the rigging up to effectively pull from both sides rather than the middle and, and achieve that? Yeah, I mean, you, you certainly could do that. Um, yeah. And they do do that, I think, on some models have uh, have setups for that. Like for going downwind in really light winds, you, you want to hold the boom out again because if you just leave it to gravity, it will come to the middle and you'll have less area. Just just going back to the hold thing again, you know, we, we had this issue when we started a couple of years ago and one of the hold modes that we came up with was a figure eight hold, you know, where you sail across the wind and then you drive downwind and you sail across the wind again. And it's, you know, it's like an active hold, but in our case, we wanted to do it because we were towing something behind the boat and we didn't want it to drop to the bottom so we needed an active hold mode and a figure eight across the wind is an ideal thing where you jibe where you jibe at the other end you come back and we just had a hold radius you know it might be two 200 meters 500 meters or something like that away from the position that we've been told to hold and we just adjust our course and do a figure eight pattern backwards and forwards across there there's also you know, when our sail's down, we can do a um, hold mode where we just drift and once we get outside the hold radius, we, we motor back. And we also tried the active hold, you know, where as, as you get further away from the hold, you try and hold position and you try and motor back, but that's quite um, energy expensive, you know, trying to motor the, so we're all about conserving energy as well. So. The best way to do it, for, in our opinion, is if you're not sailing in an active hold and it's just a drift with the wind and then motor back to back to the waypoint radius type of thing. Yeah, I mean, and and really, this this loiter behaviour is sort of an accident. Like it's that's what Rover did anyway. It, it if you get outside the radius, it points you towards the the centre of the circle, and and tries to go forwards until yeah, you get to the, to the next radius. <laughs> That's not being tested too much in the rover code because rovers normally don't drift when they're sitting on land. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So again, it's sort of the loiter is just what rover had already happened to work uh, yeah. good enough that I never did anything more, okay. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got a question from King, uh, Ken King. You got a hand up, Ken? Ken? Yeah. How are you doing, Peter? Um, yeah, I'm just Hi. wondering about the energy consumption in general. Is it suitable 
for or like how long will it will it run for and is it in general and is it suitable for solar power generation and uh, net positive solar power generation uh yeah i mean potentially i mean so my i haven't done much testing with the new boat but the old boat you could put it on a lipo and sail all day basically it, it hardly uses anything um yeah so i mean yeah this this new one, I suspect, will use rather more <laughs> with all its moving bits. But um, yeah, it would be good to get a handle on that to see what the ratio is between a, tr a typical sailboat and a, a performance one. Yeah, 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 definitely. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that talk, Pete. That was absolutely brilliant. So round of applause for Pete Hall. Thank you. All right.